Hello, welcome. My name's John. Uh, I'm a software developer here at Depop, and I'm part of the data infrastructure team at Robert. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, testing machine learning models in staging. Uh, so throughout this talk, uh, I'm going to be referring to our product recommendations feature. Um, it's a classic graph-based algorithm um, where we have users and products as the nodes and the edges are interactions. Um, and the goal is that we have similar users being recommended similar products. Um, the interactions we're looking at uh, in Depop are likes, saves, products, uh, uh, on products, uh, messages and comments, and obviously purchases. Um, if you're interested in how this algorithm works more, we've got a link at the, at the bottom of the slide when the slide gets, uh, gets sent out. And uh, you can check out my friend uh, John's uh, blog post. Okay, so uh, as we all know, testing is extremely important. Um, it's a safety net that stops us from pushing uh, production issues, bugs, uh, performance issues into production. Um, yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> my first time, sorry. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the test didn't work. Um, so when we're uh, testing things here at Depop, uh, we try and think about the structure of our test before we start deployment. Um, uh, so sometimes this is covered by a few unit tests or integration tests or um, even performance tests, but when we're looking at machine learning systems, it's not that simple. Sometimes we have uh, subjective outputs of our machine learning models. So suppose we're doing a color detection model um, I don't suppose you've seen this picture before. Um, it, co it caused quite a commotion back in uh, a few years ago at some point. Uh, so people didn't know whether it was going to be blue or black, or blue and black, or white and gold. So uh, can I have a quick hands up? Who thinks it's blue and black? Ah, don't like that. Um, what about white and gold? Anyone got white and gold? You're liars. Um, I, I've genuinely never met anyone who's uh, said it was white and gold until Saturday when I was rehearsing with, with my dad. And I just thought he was having me on. Um, but the point is, we don't know what the, the output is going to be. And we can't test it deterministically. So how do we do uh, the testing? Well, we can unit test the, the business logic, like with um, most uh, of our features. Um, we can maybe validate the output, um, but the way it's usually done in the industry is by monitoring the effects that the, the model has on the, uh, on the business. So for here at Depop, it's the number of saves, the number of uh, purchases, the number of likes on a product for our recommendations feature. If they go up, then we're happy with the algorithm, but if it goes down, then um, we've, we've done something wrong. Um, I saw a, a talk at Spark conference by um, Holden Corral on validating big data and ML pipelines uh, this year and or last year, and it's really good. And there's a link at the bottom if you're interested in, in learning how this is done. Uh, for you. So, say we've got two versions of our algorithm and we want to A, A B test them in production. Well, uh, we set out on a, on a two week test and uh, it, it passes all of our unit tests, so we can stick it in prod and then see what happens. On the first week, it doesn't do so well. Um, it's the, the business metrics are showing that we're doing worse. And towards the end of the second week, it really severely slides. And basically what we've done is we've given our users a bad experience. And they might not come back to our app because they've been recommended uh, bad products and they think we're a bad company. So we want to try and avoid this at all costs. Um, so, can we do better? Well, this is the, the question that we asked ourselves when we were planning our uh, product recommendations feature. Is there a way that we can sanity check our recommendations uh, algorithm before we push it to production? Um, so, in order to do this, we need to um, create staging data that uh, reflects the production data. But because of our, our dear friend GDPR, we can't just copy over the production data into staging. So, we looked at our staging data and it wasn't uh, full enough that we, it would be eligible for recommendations. Um, so we needed a way to create this data. So 
What are the differences between our staging data and our production data? Well, as you can see here, we've got um, a picture from our staging data. It doesn't, we don't sell cats and trees and dogs on Depop. In fact, you're not allowed. Um, it's mod data. Um, often with our tests, we are asserting the existence of a field. So we might have checking that there's, the product has a description. And that description might be a string that says description or a, a random string. It doesn't tie into what the product's about, so we won't have a, a picture with a cat with a description that says cat. Um, in particular, uh, with our recommendations feature, uh, we have no notion of what a user is. So when all this data comes together, it just it was just nonsense. It didn't it didn't mean anything. Uh, but so we we try to address that and and find out what what type of our users are on staging. So uh, a type of user we might be interested in would be, say, uh, a hipster. Uh, what, what, do they, what are they interested in rec uh, being recommended? Uh, the second thing is, like this car, um, our data isn't very dynamic. Our users often come back to the app and interact with the products over and over again. Um, but in staging, most of the users are created by regression tests. So given I'm a Depop user, when I like a product, uh, uh, then uh, I can see it in my likes, and so it, it gets created, it performs an action, but then it becomes dormant. We need our staging data to come back and interact uh, enough to be eligible for our recommendations feature. Uh, the final thing is the size of the data. Um, on the left here we've got our staging environment. Um, there's only about half a million products and users in there. And on the right we've got um, production, big production. Uh, it's got 93 million uh, products and just about 12 million users. Um, as we know with ML algorithms, we need uh, a large amount of, of data for it to be effective. So we needed to increase the amount of data that we had in staging. So, how did we do it? Well, we come back to our initial goal that was we need similar users to uh, like similar products. That's our assumption. Um, so we need to define what uh, the notion of similar users is. So we needed to partition our, our user base into um, a number of classes. And we can think of these classes as types of users. So we've got two people here. We've got uh, a goth person and uh, the best cartoon hipster I could find. Um, and we're gonna take their user IDs and then we're gonna reduce them modulo five. Uh, and based on the output of this, then we can, we can book it them. So uh, a hipster dude goes into U1 and a goth goes into U0. So uh, we're going to concentrate on the U0 class uh, that we're going to say are the goths. Um, next, uh, we've, so we've got similar users. Now we need to think about what those users might like in our staging environment. So as we know, um, goths, they tend to like black stuff. So these boots, we're going to probably say they're going to like these with about 95% uh, of the time they're going to interact with these boots. Um, these blue ones, I could see it, I don't know about you, um, let's say 50%. Red ones, not so much. I, I've never seen a goth wearing it with boots and I challenge you to find a goth that wears Peppa Pig slippers. Um, so, we do the same thing for uh, all of our user classes by computing the, the difference between the user ID and the product ID and then reducing it mod 5 to, uh, to calculate these preferences. Um, so we've made the users, we know what they like, so now we need a way of making this data. So we created a, an AWS Lambda function that um, creates a load of users, they list products and then all of those users and products interact with each other. On the, on the fly. Um, so here's a, an example of a staging user profile uh, where the, the numbers indicate uh, the type of product or the product class that, uh, it, that they are. Um, so the, this is the interaction procedure. Sorry. Um, for each user, we're going to get the, the set of products that they can interact with, which are the other users' products, and they're going to do a number of interactions. Uh, so we're going to select a random product and we can get the class from that product. Therefore, we can get the, the probability between, uh, of interaction between that user and that product. Next, we're going to select a random number between 0 and 100 and uh, 
depending on whether this is bigger or smaller than the, prob uh, the preference probability, we're either going to choose to interact with this or uh, we're going to do nothing, that product will then be added back to the set of possible products and we repeat until our remaining interactions run out. Uh, we'll do this for all the users. Um, I'll just give you a second to, to read my code. Second. Um, uh, uh, so all of after we've created all of these users and, and products interact with each other, we've created a little cluster of a social graph. Um, I'll remind you that there's, the social graph contains uh, the users and the products as the nodes, and the interactions as the edges. These interactions are then streamed uh, to our data lake via Kinesis, so they're accessible for downstream systems. Um, such as uh, QA, but more importantly, our uh, Spark recommendation, uh, recommendations job. Uh, also, the users and the products are logged in a Slack channel um, for internal usage, so we can log in and see what the recommendations looks like. Um, so this is an example. Um, we can see that the numbers here represents uh, the products, and we can probably have a guess about what the user class of this recommendations is. Uh, we see threes and fours, so we can probably guess uh, by the construction of the preferences that this is a U3 user. So, um, we've done all this, now does it actually work? Well, here are our results. Um, we, across all of the user classes, we aggregated the, uh, the product recommendations uh, based upon their highest uh, to lowest uh, preferred class. So the highest class, um, which is on the left, uh, was the black boots for the uh, the golf, and it would be a U1, P1, and a U2, P2, etc. And we will uh, do the same for across all the other things, and then we will count the number of recommendations they got. Um, so it's not as high as we'd expect. Um, because we constructed the preferences in such a way that it was very heavily skewed to uh, the, the main preference. But after some consideration, it's not that surprising that we got this result. Uh, the, the graph that we, con we made was highly connected, uh, which meant that our recommendations was likely to recommend almost every product to um, each user. Uh, so we've got a slight distribution. Um, but not as good as we'd expect. Uh, the fourth column is a bit higher than we think as well. Um, this is probably due to the cyclical nature that we constructed the preferences. So if we think back to our uh, goth hipster example, the goth really liked the black boots, uh, and it kind of liked the blue boots. The hipster was a, a U1 user. It, uh, by definition, really liked the blue boots. I mean, I, I don't, don't take that too literally, because it probably wouldn't, but... Um, that, in that way, the, the hipster and the goth are similar users, so we're going to recommend them similar products. But the, the hipster really doesn't like the, the black boots because he had a, a preference of 1% with them. So even though they're similar, we might recommend them uh, some of their lower preferred uh, items. So how can we use it? Well, when we're deploying a new version of our algorithm, uh, we can run our lambda and make some new users and then aggregate the data to compare the distributions. Um, so we're going to look at some examples. Uh, here's our original version and then we deploy v2. v2 looks a bit like this. So it's slightly worse on the test data um, it, but it's got a similar distribution and we have to go back to the fact that this is a sanity check so this actually might be okay. It, it's, it's similar, it's not as good, but um, it, it is test data at the end of the day. Um, we might want to investigate why the, the fourth column's gone up, um, but there's a chance we might push this on. But then we go to V3. Well, V3 has got a completely different distribution. It, it looks bad, right? We're getting Peppa Pig recommended to Goff. Uh, this is gonna give our users a really bad experience. And if we put this in production, people aren't going to come back. We're going to look stupid. Um, so we're not going to continue with this deployment. And we're going to maintain that good user experience. Uh, the, the final graph is, for some reason, um, our uh, conditions for being involved in the recommendations was too stringent. 
And when we ran it on the test, everything got filtered out. Now we can't not recommend people, we, uh, we, we can't just disappear, so we're not going to continue with this deployment either. Um, again, maintaining that good user experience. Um, so, in conclusion, um, here at Depop we're going to try and test everything before um, it goes to production. In order to do so, when we're doing ML models in particular, we need to create data that reflects production. Um, and in, after we're doing so, we're allowed to uh, sanity check our models that maintains this good user experience for our users. Um, here's our Twitter handle, uh, our engineering blog. Um, and we're hiring, so if you're interested in working for Depop and solving some interesting problems, uh, you can speak to any of the people who've got these name badges, uh, in particular Penny and uh, Jules, wherever he is, he's at back. Um, any questions?